In the main choir of the chapel in the Franciscan church in Arezzo, Piera della Francesca painted a fresco cycle narrating the stories of the True Cross. The subject matter of the stories is drawn from Jacobus de Voragine's Golden Legend, a 13th century text that recounts the miraculous story of the wood that made up Christ's cross. The story tells how Adam, on his deathbed, sends his son Seth to the archangel Michael, who gives him some seedlings from the tree of original sin, which are to be placed in his father's mouth at the moment of his death. The tree that grows on the patriarch's grave is chopped down by King Solomon, and its wood, which could not be used for anything else, is thrown across a stream to serve as a bridge. The Queen of Sheba, on her journey to see Solomon and hear his words of wisdom, is about to cross the stream when, by a miracle, she learns that the Saviour will be crucified on that wood. She kneels in devout adoration. When Solomon discovers the nature of the divine message received by the Queen of Sheba, he orders that the bridge be removed and the wood, which will cause the end of the kingdom of the Jews, be buried. But the wood is found and becomes the instrument of the Passion. Three centuries later, just before the Battle of Ponte Milvio against Maxentius, Emperor Constantine is told in a dream that he must fight in the name of the cross to overcome his enemy. After Constantine's victory, his mother Helena travels to Jerusalem to recover the miraculous wood. No one knows where the relic of the cross is except a Jew called Judas. Judas is tortured in a well and confesses that he knows the temple where the three crosses of Calvary are hidden. Helena orders that the temple be destroyed, the three crosses are found, and the true cross is recognized because it causes the miraculous resurrection of a dead youth. Later, in the year 615, the Persian king Khosros steals the wood, setting it up as an object of worship. The eastern emperor, Heraclius, wages war on the Persian king, and having defeated him, returns to Jerusalem with the holy wood. But a divine power prevents the emperor from making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So Heraclius, setting aside all pomp and magnificence, enters the city, carrying the cross in a gesture of humility, following Jesus Christ's example. Section 1. The Death of Adam Adam, on his deathbed, sends his son Seth to the archangel Michael, who gives him some of the seedlings from the tree of original sin to be placed in his father's mouth at the moment of his death. In the shadow of a huge tree, Adam's body is buried in the presence of his family. The frieze depicts Adam, now 900 years old and dying, on the ground, supported by the ancient Eve. He is speaking to three of their sons, who attend with thoughtful resignation. As his strength fades, Adam reveals the logic of his death. His original sin brings death, and death brings the need for salvation. The story of the true cross will explain how salvation will be delivered. The figure with the white beard represents Seth, Adam's oldest living son, who refuses to accept his father's death. In the small scene in the background, Seth returns to the gate of paradise and asks the arch archangel Michael for the oil of mercy to keep his father alive. The angel refuses, but tells Seth to plant a branch of the tree of knowledge in his father's body. Adam's dead body is shown with the head towards the picture plane. Seth kneels behind him to plant the branch in his mouth. They are surrounded by other members of the family in various poses of mourning, some in quiet contemplation, one quite violent in grief. Their clothing represents the stages of the progression from primitive nudity to coverings of fur and animal skin to figures in the full cloth togas of ancient civilization. Section 2. The Procession of the Queen of Sheba and the Meeting Between the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon The tree that grows on the patriarch Adam's grave is chopped down by King Solomon, and its wood, which could not be used for anything else, is thrown across a stream to serve as a bridge. The Queen of Sheba, on her journey to see Solomon and to hear his words of wisdom, is about to cross the stream, when, 
By a miracle, she learns that the Saviour would be crucified on that wood, and she kneels in devout adoration. The Queen of Sheba's encounter with Solomon takes place in a temple-like structure. Solomon stands with his courtiers. The Queen, entering from the right, deferentially bows to him. The Queen prophesied to Solomon that the domination of the Jews would one day be destroyed by the man who would hang from that beam. Solomon's response was to have the beam sunk in a well. Christ himself speaks of Sheba's journey. The Queen of the South came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold a greater than Solomon here. Matthew 12, verse 42. Medieval writers saw in these lines a reference to the marriage of Christ and the Church, and as proof of the supersession of Christianity. The episode is not ordinarily associated with the story of the cross. Sheba and her retinue of women and mounted grooms have come to a halt in the riverside grove. The queen has miraculously recognised as holy a heavy beam of wood used as a bridge over the river Silo, and she kneels in veneration. Her gorgeous ladies-in-waiting exclaim at her prescience. In the great audience hall, King Solomon greets the visiting queen with a gracious hand-clasp, a gesture often symbolic of marriage. She lowers herself to pay homage to Solomon's superior wisdom. What is odd about this interaction is that, in the story of the True Cross, Solomon at this point was quite angry. Having admired the tree that grew from Adam's body, he wished to use it in building his new palace. He was denied this wish, however, because the wood miraculously kept changing size. In a rage, he had it cast out and used as a footbridge. To make matters worse, the Queen prophesied that his downfall would come through the power of a man who would hang from that log. Section 3. The Burial of the Wood When Solomon discovers the nature of the divine message received by the Queen of Sheba, he orders that the bridge be removed and the wood, which will cause the end of the kingdom of the Jews, be buried. Disposal of the, rec the recalcitrant piece of wood is crucial to the continuity of the story of the True Cross, since it identifies the wood's location during the time between the Old and New Testaments. Three slovenly men are shown struggling to push what is now a plank of wood into a body of water. The first has dishevelled his clothes in the strain. The second, pushing up with a stick, bites his lip with exertion. The third uses only his hands to push, while the wreath on his head implies a bit of tippling. Following Solomon's orders, they are trying to hide the wood forever, but to no avail. Much later, the wood will rise to the surface of what has become known as the probatic pool, working miracles by healing the sick and the lame who come to bathe there. Section 4. The Vision of Constantine Three centuries later, just before the Battle of Ponte Milvio against Maxentius, Emperor Constantine, who took up position with his army next to the river, was awakened by an angel who told him to look up at the sky. There he saw a glowing cross circled by the words, In hoc signo vinces. The next morning he had a replica of the cross made and carried it before him into the battle, in which he was victorious. Constantine and his rival Maxentius were vying for the position of Emperor of Rome and about to do battle at the Milvian Bridge over the Tiber in Rome. The night before the battle, just before the dawn, Constantine lies in bed, guarded by a halberdier and a sentry holding a mace, who blocks entry into the tent. From the star-studded heavens above, an angel streaks down, extending toward the sleeping general a tiny, glowing cross, the divine illumination of which lights up the darkness. Although his eyes are closed, Constantine sees what we see, but not yet understanding its meaning. His attendant, sitting in a melancholy pose, seems to comprehend. Constantine lies at the foot of the tent pole, like the figure of Adam at the foot of the cross. Section 5. Constantine's Victory Over Maxentius Accepting the invitation of the angel, Constantine leads his ranks of armed horsemen with arms outstretched, brandishing the cross. Maxentius and his troops flee. They ford the river. A 
According to the legend surrounding the battle, Constantine and Maxentius, both being Romans, no blood could be shed. Maxentius had devised a ruse by which Constantine's army would be drowned in the Tiber. Part of Constantine's revelation was that his victory was assured by the power of the cross. He thus entered the fray with only the angelic gift, and he won. Amid a forest of lances and thundering hooves, the cavalry, surmounted by a glorious imperial eagle flag, calms as it moves from left to right and stops at the figure of Constantine erect on his white horse. He extends his arm to display the tiny cross, the talisman of righteous power, faith and victory. His profile head is aglow with masculine beauty. He wears a contemporary Byzantine pointed hat, which at this time was believed to be in the style of the ancients. The imperial crown nestles there, behind the brim, indicating that the battle is already won. The scene in the right half of the panel has suffered a great loss of paint over the centuries. It takes place before a Tuscan lands landscape near the source of the Tiber. With its country houses and calm reflections in the water, notice the ducks floating on the surface. The battle has thus been relocated to the outskirts of Arezzo. The forces of Maxentius are in flight. An equestrian officer scrambles up the riverbank. All that can be seen of Maxentius himself is the peak of his headgear, indicating that it was in the same Greek-style hat as Constantine's, but with the colours reversed. As the loser, he is in identified as ignoble by his routed, naked slave, and by the venomous basilisk blazon on his flag. Section 6. The Torture of the Jew Following Constantine's conversion, his mother, the Empress Helena, also became a devoted Christian and travelled to Jerusalem to search for the true cross. There, she learns that only one man, ironically named Judas, knows where the cross is hidden, and when he refuses to give up, give up the secret, Helena's men throw him into a dry well. After seven days of torture, Judas relents and is taken to Helena, where, reluctantly, he indicates the whereabouts of the cross. Two rather fancily dressed youths are shown pulling down on the rope of a pulley, hoisting Judas to the ground level. Another official forces him to take the last step by pulling his hair. While the scene may at first strike one as rather bizarre, a deep meaning soon becomes clear. The Old Testament high priest Habakkuk was forcibly taken by the hair by an angel when he refused to deliver food to Daniel in the lion's den. Thus, like Habakkuk, Judas was taken where he did not wish to go, and ended by performing deeds of a higher good. Judas soon understood his mission, and for his devotion, he was later named Bishop of Jerusalem. Section 7. The Finding and Recognition of the True Cross Judas is tortured in a well and confesses that he knows with the temple where the three crosses of Calvary are hidden. Helena orders that the temple be destroyed. The three crosses are found, and the true cross is recognised because it causes the miraculous resurrection of a dead youth. Helena and her entourage, including a well-dressed dwarf, observe the work of digging up the crosses. Two workmen lift the last to be found out of the pit. Proof of the miraculous power of the true cross is proved. When it is touched to the body of a dead boy on the way to burial, he revives. Section 8. The Battle Between Heraclius and Cosros The True Cross became famous over the centuries as it performed miracle after miracle. According to the legend, the Sasanian king, Cosros II, coveted its power and stole the relic and used it to subjugate his citizens. Heraclius, the emperor of Byzantium, in AD 528, came with his troops to rescue the cross by force. This is a complex battle full of blood and heavy weaponry. The procession to victory can be read in the flags, moving from the imperial eagle to the standards of Islam, one decorated with Moorish figures in tatters, the other with crescent moons falling to the ground. The warriors on both sides wear all sorts of armour, including colourful Roman moulded leather and Renaissance-style harnesses of polished laminated steel. 
A war-weary bugler in a tall white hat sounds his horn, while all around him weapons fly through the air. At the right-hand edge of the battle, a mounted knight receives a dagger thrust to the throat, and as he falls back, he seems to regurgitate the cross from his very mouth. At the far right, the cross forms part of the blasphemous Trinitarian tabernacle that Cosros had set up. He called himself God, mounting the cross on his right as the sun, and a cock on a column to his left as the Holy Spirit. Having refused baptism, Cosros leaves his throne empty and kneels awaiting the executioner's sword. Around him are his judges. Section 9. The Exaltation of the Cross Heraclius wished to bring the cross back to Jerusalem after his victory over the Persian king, but a, div a divine power prevents the emperor from making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So Heraclius, setting aside all pomp and magnificence, has carried the cross barefoot up to the walls of Jerusalem. There he and his train are met by a group of men who kneel down before the cross in veneration. Heraclius had been stopped by an angel when he tried to enter Jerusalem on horseback, wearing the trappings of a warrior emperor. Now he has shed his finery and walks barefoot, carrying the cross in his hands. At the head of a procession of attendants, again exotically dressed in eastern garb, he acts out the ancient ceremony of, of Adventus, the Roman ritual of greeting, held outside the city to honour a visiting official. In this ritual, the further from the city the crowd comes out, the higher the honour. The distance from the great walled city in the background, and, the, and on the right, is suggested by the small scale of a white-haired elder who scurries along the path. In this ceremony, it is not the emperor, but the cross, that is paid respect. So ends the cycle as it began, with the focus of attention on the wood of the sacred cross. <laughs>